members who I will introduce to begin with will spend a few moments uh, describing their perception and their perspective on how things are going to change over the next five years in the pharmaceutical and the biopharmaceutical industry, as well as diagnostics. Um, and then we'll open it uh, where the, I think in the past the most value has come, um, no offense, uh, from the questions and the answers and the interaction between the attendees and the panel members. Um, having said that, so this is, I try to keep this as informal as possible. Having said that, let me first introduce uh, Mary Pentegrass, who will spend a, a bit of time talking uh, about the FDA and its changing uh, persona and where it, uh, she sees it going over the next four or five years. Mary. Thank you. I'll speak briefly so that we can have as much interaction as possible. Uh, I was asked to think about what the FDA is going to be doing in the next four to five years. And it, in Washington, we have to divide that up into presidential um, administration. So we've got two more years of the Obama administration. You'll see a lot of activity in the next year. The last year before any presidential election, the Office of Management and Budget basically shuts down all the federal agencies, don't let, doesn't let them do new initiatives. So in that year, you'll see just a continuation, pretty much, of what they've been doing, although that, I'll, as I'll explain, that's going to be quite a bit of information. I think that over the next four, at least in the next administration, it's harder to say um, what exactly will happen. We don't know. I think that enforcement is going to be a key issue for the agency going forward. All of the signals are in place that it's going to start exercising criminal enforcement against the uh, CEOs and the other senior management of pharmaceutical and device uh, companies. So any, if any of you are criminal defense lawyers, um, get your pencils sharpened. You're in for a ride. I think that drug approvals will get worse before they get better. FDA is positioning itself to have tough negotiations over its user fee laws which will be uh, re-upped in September of 2012. They're um, taking this very tight and prescriptive attitude so they can say, well, the only thing we promise you is to review your drug. We never promised you that we'd talk to you. And so two companies in the past week have gotten complete response letters rather than approvals because the FDA would not talk to them on the phone to resolve scientific questions. I think you'll see more of this, not less, as we go forward. The Center for Devices is reeling from uh, some FDA self-imposed problems in terms of permitting congressional pressure and political pressure to change the result of a medical device review. Uh, this has caused a, a major reaction at the FDA. Uh, there's Institute of Medicine hearings. They're, uh, all the workers that are there are afraid that they're doing the wrong thing. It's making device approvals very slow. I think that that will continue for the next two or three years as they sort out where they are on the continuum between being strict and being not strict. I think that with respect to biologics, we're going to see a rocky road towards biosimilars. And I say it's a rocky road not because the technology is going to be so hard, but because, um, for reasons that are not clear, the agency is um, not communicating its expectations. And it's always hard for all companies, whether they're pioneer or biosimilar in this case, to get grounded when the agency isn't talking. In 1984, when Congress passed a law permitting generic drugs to go on the market, by this time, six months after the law was passed, FDA had put out six letters to industry explaining their early thinking about what the law meant, about what companies should be getting ready to do. We've had radio silence from the FDA on biosimilars, although they are holding a meeting on it to get advice in the next couple of weeks. I also think that um, one of the things that we just have to accept is the fact that all manufacturing of anything that the FDA cares about in the therapeutic space is being done in countries that are now the factories of the world, India and China. This manufacturing, when I started out in the 70s at the FDA, most of the manufacturing was done in the United States. There were big chemical companies like Mallinckrodt and St. Louis. 
that did the manufacturing here in the States. It then went to Western Europe and then Eastern Europe. It's now in China and India. And it's much, much harder with that longer chain for the FDA to get its hands around the quality of the products. And as we saw with melamine contaminated pet food and um, contaminated heparin and all this kind of thing, the FD FDA is under heavy pressure to resolve that problem and get strict across the entire chain from the active pharmaceutical ingredient or raw ingredient to the end product. There aren't enough people in the world at the FDA to do this, so they're, they're going to be forcing industry to do it um, rather than have them inspect that quality into the system. And finally, uh, just big picture, I think that everybody's trying to move towards rare diseases. I think that everybody recognizes that the era of the blockbuster is dangerous <coughs> for safety reasons and for no other reason. You get premium pricing when you've got a rare disease. That was the model that Genzyme so effectively used. Everybody is now using diagnostics to have a special class of patients that for sure, for sure, for sure will benefit from the drug. Everyone's got, you know, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollar price tags in their brains for what those drugs will be able to commend in the marketplace. And I think that that's not sustainable. And so what we'll see is we'll see the rise of rare diseases, approvals, people getting hugely frustrated at the cost, and then some other model will take place. Mary, one, one of the, uh, the benefits of being the moderator is I can ask the first question, and I'll turn it over to the audience. You made a reference that the, uh, earlier that the, um, the Obama administration, if it is a one-term administration, and the last year is everybody's on hold, and, and another administration, a non-democratic administration, comes in, how would you, given your experience, see the FDA changing? Or are they on a path irrespective of what the administration is going to do? Administrations play an enormous role in uh, telling the agency how to uh, enforce the law. So depending on who the administration is, it could be very different. Um, so I think, that, I think that you will see uh, huge swings, especially in enforcement, um, if there's a different, if there's a, a different and more uh, easygoing administration. From the floor, please. Yeah, you mentioned uh, your last point about rare diseases and, uh, and frustration about costs and so forth. I was under the impression that the use of the diagnostics was designed to create subsets <coughs> of patients as a way of, bring, partly as a way of bringing down the cost of doing clinical trials. And so that the development, the development cycle for each product would be less, which would presumably bring down costs. You don't see that. Initially, that was what people hoped. Right now, a large pharma is saying uh, to the Hill and elsewhere that their, their costs of doing clinical trials with personalized medicine is actually going up, not down, because of all the validation studies they have to do to convince the FDA that the, bio mar the marker correlates with the disease. So w we'll see about that. Um, the FDA hasn't yet cut a break um, on companies when they're using diagnostics. So, well, I mean, I'm working with a company on a cardiac drug. They're still demanding a 3,000 person trial, just 3,000 people with the bio, with the marker. Please. I have a question on the optic generic drugs. Um, I think the last number I heard was that their backlog is, it takes about 27 months to get an approval for a generic. Um, other than resource allocations, which they don't seem to be getting, do you have any insight as to what is being done within the Office of Genetics Drugs to get those approvals out faster and, and cut down on that backlog? Well, they fired the head of it. Right. So that was a step. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, Forward I mean, uh, <laughs> I think seriously, though, I don't think it was his fault. He, he had been complaining for years that his office <laughs> needed more resources. I think everybody knows that. The generic drug industry is um, unwilling to uh, come to the table on user fees except with uh, demanding things that the FDA can't agree to. And so right now there's sort of a stalemate on that. Um, I think he, I don't know what the industry will do. I imagine if the backlogs get worse, or 
at a certain point it will be cheaper to just pay the user fees. What are the uh, countervailing forces against premium pricing? What's to keep premium prices from going higher? And what forces might push them down other than competition? Uh, premium pricing for rare diseases depends a lot on who the p sick people are and who's the payer. To the extent that you have premium pricing for diseases that affect Medicare and Medicaid recipients, you'll see a lot more pushback a lot faster than you will for the rare diseases that primarily affect children, which is what we've got going on now. The insurance companies are willing to pay pretty expensive prices to help a kid grow. Um, it's going to be harder for Medicare and Medicaid to, or especially Medicare, to agree to pay a lot of premium pricing for cancer when so many of the people affected by it are Medicare population. That's my guess. This is not my field, though. Bill, you have a question? Dr. Hamburg, uh, the FDA. Yeah, speak up. Oh, Dr. Hamburg, or, or Hamburg, the, the FDA commissioner at the DIA meeting this year, said one of her priorities is to invest in regulatory science. Uh, could you comment on what that might mean from your perspective and what that might mean from our perspective in terms of clinical development? Uh, the Commissioner Peggy has um, finally put some meat on that bone of regulatory science a week or so ago and what they're saying is, is they're looking to have tools for the agency to be able to understand what's coming in the door. So they're going to be focusing on beefing up the FDA's internal science on, for example, nanotechnology, um, which there's very few people at the agency that are expert in nanotechnology. I think they're looking for some new expertise in different kinds of clinical trial designs, different kinds of statistics like Bayesian <coughs> statistics. Uh, we, we'll see. It's all, this whole thing is dependent on getting funding that they don't have yet because Congress left town without um, funding the agencies. So everybody's on what's called a continuing resolution for last year's money that doesn't include money for this. Any other questions for Merritt? Any, excuse me, any optics on what we might expect in terms of uh, combination products, for example, uh, biologics and devices? No, I think that that's just sort of going along at a slow and steady pace. I mean, if what you mean is like the scaffolding and then the skin or things like that. Well, um, um, as a start and then delivery of genetic vectors, uh, delivery of stem cells, delivery of a variety of different... They're slowly getting their hands around that, but I would say slowly. Well, over any, uh, any guidance, expectations, you were talking about radio silence, you know, um, before and biosimilars, sort of comparable here, it's hard to sort of know what the time horizon might be for those types yeah. of um, I think that the Center for Biologics is giving a little more guidance to industry than the Center for Drugs is about their issues. So. But before Biox, there was a, a, an attempt to look at the ways of using mathematical techniques to uh, make clinical trials less cost effective. In other words, by improving the output, reducing the standard deviation, you could maybe reduce the sample size and, and, and adapt to the maximum likelihood and stuff like that. But Viac seems to have thrown all that up in the air. What's going on with that? Can, is there any hope to eventually reduce the cost of clinical trials to effectively? I think you have to separate out safety and effectiveness because they're operating on completely different tracks. The size of the clinical trials to determine effectiveness are getting smaller. Um, the ICH standards sort of are holding, but the size of the clinical trials needed to prove safety are getting exponentially bigger. So the trials look a lot bigger. So for example, for diabetes, you may only need 500 people to prove that your drug is effective, but the FDA is imposing a 5,000 person trial to look for cardiac side effects. So the trial is now 5,000. So um, that's the yin and the yang of it. We'll and take, you can I'm take, Viac, yeah, Viac started, well actually, uh, GSK's uh, antidepressants started it. That's where we are.
James McCullough is the CEO of Dexasome, and uh, let me introduce him. I was nervous when I was talking to uh, Mary out in the hallway, and now I'm just basically scared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the technology of Exosome, but it's, uh, it, it's fascinating for me. I've been involved in uh, biotechnology for about a decade, and I actually came out of telecommunications. But um, w what I'm seeing right now is an absolute explosion of information. And we're going to a point now where the human genome, this is a classic uh, technology cycle. You've got something which is discovered, which is a game changer, and you have a lot of early adopters, you have some very interesting things that come out, and then all of a sudden uh, the big players start to get interested and involved and the real money starts to come in. And we're, we're in a situation right now where my biggest issue in the diagnostic game, we're doing something very novel in oncology and in metabolism, metabolic disease, uh, my biggest issue is how do I manage the information that I'm getting, a lot of which is all novel now and correlative to disease outcome. But it's, it's a vast quantity of information. We have tools just 18 months ago that we did, we never had before. We're seeing things. Uh, somebody gave me a great analogy at, at a conference uh, a month ago uh, with regard to the, the human genome. They said, the last couple of years we've been using Galileo's telescope to look at the sky, and now all of a sudden we have the Hubble. And this information is going to pose an increasingly uh, difficult problem for the regulatory agencies. In my business, diagnostics, uh, there's an outlet, uh, and it, it's, uh, it's an interesting outlet. It's called uh, Homebrew, which sort of conjures up this image of uh, two guys in a basement uh, mixing up beakers. But homebrews are uh, a class of tests which can be operated under uh, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act, CLIA. Uh, one of the, the biggest models for this was a uh, company called Genomic Health, which launched a uh, test on breast cancer called Oncotype PX. And uh, they did very well. They spent a lot of money marketing it directly to the patient to say, you want to get this uh, genetic test to determine whether you are going to recur post-surgically with breast cancer. And they did very well. They had great pricing in it, uh, somewhere around $2,600, I think, is the average reimbursement they get uh, for this test. And it really blazed the way. And they ran it without regulatory approval because they could do it under the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act. Uh, the, uh, and the interesting thing is, if you look at a lot of the major labs, Mayo Clinic, the majority of the tests they run are home root tests, laboratory developed tests. Uh, LabCorp, uh, its biggest profit margin comes from laboratory developed tests, homebrews. So uh, there's a lot of people operating with very interesting tests outside of the regulatory framework. Sometimes it goes too far. Uh, there was a case uh, a couple of years ago when Steve Gutman uh, was in the, the FDA, uh, the lab court took a test with relatively limited clinical information, it was called Oversure, uh, out of Yale University, and put it into their system as a homebrew test. <coughs> Uh, it ran into a lot of problems, obviously, because ovarian cancer is a hot uh, political topic, and they went into the early part of the diagnostic spectrum. You have screening, you have primary diagnosis, then you have disease monitoring and what we call companion diagnostics, which is theranostics, uh, choosing which patients work with what drugs. And the FDA reacted very vigor vigorously to that, as they should have, uh, because this really wasn't a test that had a huge amount of data behind it, and they were going into a very difficult area. Um, we, Exosome Diagnostics was formed in uh, 2008. We did a, an exclusive license with uh, Harvard University and Mass General. Uh, a bunch of researchers there discovered that there were microvesicles, or about the same size as a virus, uh, that are they're part of our normal intracellular communication process. We all have these things called exosomes circulating around in our body fluids. And they're basically a biological FedEx. So they'll be exocytosed, they'll be put out of a cell, and endocytosed, pulled into a cell after circulating around in the blood or the urine or saliva or the cerebral spinal fluid. And exosomes have been known for a long time. What these guys discovered was that they contain nucleic acids, so RNA and DNA. And in fact, it turns out that they contain a boatload of nucleic acids, what we call the transcriptome, which is this entire uh, huge set of uh, genetic instructions and information. And as we got further into the project, we realized that these exosomes were the primary source of genetic mutation in cancer. 
specifically RNA that's mutated, which is the foundation for a lot of cancers. So we dove in, uh, we did a $20 million round in uh, May with two great venture capitalists who understood this, and we're now uh, uh, in just an absolute dead gallop to uh, put out a series of diagnostics, primarily in oncology, which is a very hot space right now, where we can actually take a blood draw from a cancer patient and measure what we call dysregulation. So we can take a blood draw from a cancer patient, isolate those exosomes, those little particles floating around in the blood, crack them open like eggs, and we can pull out uh, genetic mutations, rare genetic mutations, that a lot of which have been validated in tissue. Uh, one of the big uh, uh, mutations that we're looking at is a mutation called BRAF, uh, which is uh, a major mutation in melanoma. 60% of melanoma patients have a, B, a, a mutation in their BRAF gene. And we've been able to isolate the BRAF mutation uh, out of blood, which is a major advantage because uh, it's very difficult to get a tissue biopsy off of a melanoma patient, especially post-surgically. You don't know what's wandering around in the body. And if we can take a blood draw and measure this mutation, we can track the disease, and we can also uh, tell you that this patient actually has this mutation, you can treat it. Uh, and in fact, not to go too far, but uh, it was a, a stunning example. It was a phase one study uh, run by Roche uh, for a drug called Plexicon, PLX4032. Uh, we're working with one of the primary investigators out of uh, Mass General Harvard. Uh, and they took basically the walking dead patients. Uh, these were patients that were stage four metastatic. Uh, their lives were measured in weeks. They really didn't have much of an option and they were enrolled in the safety study for this, this new drug that targeted this mutation, BRAF. And I wish I had a slide to show this, but uh, you can look it up. There was a series that was run in the New York Times uh, a couple of months ago, uh, which talked about this. And these patients had an intense reaction uh, to this drug. And this was personalized medicine uh, in action. This was, okay, we know these patients have this particular mutation so we're going to develop a drug that treats that particular mutation. And suddenly we had stage four metastatic, colon pain, uh, col uh, metastatic uh, melanoma patients that had an extended survival rate to eight months, I believe it was on average. And there's still some of them that are alive uh, 14, 16 months later. Astounding stuff. And this is the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. There are 50 mutations, 60 mutations which have already been identified for specific cancers, each one of which we need to look at, and we need to track them as you're being treated so you can find out when you develop resistance uh, and that mutation disappears and another one pops up. It's the HIV viral load model. We're ultimately moving, in fact, we're already starting to move. A lot of the, the thought leaders are starting to move towards the cocktail therapy uh, approach uh, using these drugs that target specific uh, mutations. Right now, today, it's happening. So when somebody breaks through, busts through their therapy that's dealing with the BRAF gene, they put them on a MEK inhibitor, they put them on a KRAS inhibitor, uh, all of these different uh, genetic things. So this, this is the dawn of, of personalized medicine. And uh, it's happening now, and it's suddenly, it, it is exploding because now we have the computing power and the techniques. It's called sequencing. A lot of you probably heard of this. Uh, uh, sequencing allows us to go in and measure uh, every single possible perturbation that happens along the pathway of the human genome in a specific disease. So you can take a cancer population and you can sequence out all the genes, see what's <coughs> mutating in that population, and then you try to come to the lowest common denominator. Uh, and ultimately where I think this, this goes is you're going to have somebody who comes in with melanoma and we say, okay, we're gonna look at these 20 genes, and you may have seven of those genes mutated, so therefore you're going on these four therapies, and we're gonna follow you through that course of therapy until you start to have disease recurrence, and then we're gonna shift you. That's sophisticated stuff. Uh, but what I'm hearing now on the regulatory side uh, is that we're having problems defining how to approve, uh, how to clear one gene. Uh, and uh, we have to figure out a way or, or a new model because, you know, one gene is old news now. Uh, we're talking about panels of genes coming up. 
and panels of genes which have significant, each one of us is going to have a different type of cancer. Uh, there's no, there's going to, I think we're going to be moving to a place where you don't just have melanoma cancer uh, or you don't have colon cancer. You've got BRAF V600 mutated, EGFR variant 3 mutated cancer, and you're going to need, you know, a bunch of drugs. There are something like a hundred and uh, more than 150 drug companies right now that have over 350 molecular therapies. This is the new generation of drugs to treat genetic mutations in the clinic. Where are we going to go? I'm going over no, no, that's quite, that's quite okay. Uh, I'm sure everybody in the room is wondering what you were scared of when you first started your kind of, you know, little presentation. Uh, half of them probably didn't uh, know maybe uh, exactly what you were speaking about. But let me ask a question and then turn it over to the floor. Um, your area of expertise, exosome, and what you're talking about is the diagnostic end. Yes. And you talked about the cocktails. And to what extent, from your perspective, have the cocktails um, uh, stayed close to the diagnostic capability? In other words, if you can diagnose, does that automatically mean that you can treat at this time? That, that's the million dollar question. Uh, and it's a very good question. Uh, the answer is you need to have a next generation of diagnostics now to be able to identify your mutations. This is personalized medicine. What are your personal mutations for your specific disease? It's not just oncology. It moves into Alzheimer's disease, moves into diabetes, moves into... Uh, and the problem is when you... Uh, we, we are actually focused in the field of companion diagnostics, which is a diagnostic that is paired with a drug uh, which actually goes into the drug label, into the PMA, uh, so that uh, the physicians use uh, the diagnostic prior to prescribing the drug. And this has already been done. Uh, case in point is a uh, gene called KRAS, uh, and it turns out that if you have a mutation in your KRAS gene and you are a colon cancer patient, uh, then you're not allowed to take herbitux which is a new molecular therapy because it's not, uh, it's not going to be any good. And at 10,000 bucks a dose for a six to nine month course of uh, medicine, you better know whether, you're, whether you've got the mutation which allows you to take the drug or not. Uh, and, and this is just, I suppose the point I'm trying to make, and I'm blathering on here, I apologize uh, at all, but the, uh, the point I'm trying to make is this is just one specific example. And FDA and the EMEA, the European Regulatory Agency, now require KRAS testing in colon cancer patients prior to the prescription of herbitux. Uh, but that's just one example. There, there is a huge backlog. And again, we're just scratching the surface of what this all means. So we better figure it out. Questions, David? Are you, for each patient, doing a whatever it is, three billion base pair sequencing, or do you have 10 areas of 200 genes that you're looking at, and it's a little more finite than that. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, you get lost very quickly. We did do, uh, you know, we did do Illumina High Seek, we did do uh, uh, 454. We've done a, a lot of deep sequencing in blood and urine exosomes of cancer patients, and we come up with a ton of stuff. It's fascinating. Uh, one, one quick thing, and I, and I wish I had a slide for this, but uh, a worm and a human basically had the same genetic makeup, which is very interesting. Particularly if they're a lawyer, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't go on on that. Uh, the, the difference is in uh, a very small set of, uh, a relatively small set of unknown genes, which we used to call junk, uh, which we're now discovering have, have a very primary function. We're just beginning to understand what this means. But to answer your question specifically, um, We've found that uh, it's not clinically practical. In other words, I've got to take a test and be able to put it into the market. Uh, and if I go out and do uh, complete sequencing, uh, I, I don't, first of all, I don't get intellectual property protection. Because if I have, you know, 700 genes, even though I have 100% sensitivity and specificity for ovarian cancer recurrence, somebody can come in and say, okay, well, we got 99 genes, and therefore that's our asset. Uh, 
So we're really focused on looking at specific gene pathways, EGFR, KRAS, BRAF, and we're looking at a specific gene and how it mutates because each gene, <coughs> all these examples I'm giving, I'm sorry, but the, the KRAS gene in colon cancer, it turns out it has a bunch of different mutations in that one gene and they mean different things. So we're actually uh, in the process, we're going to be using a PAC biosystem and a few other things to look at specific genes only and look at the, the 35th, 8th pair, 115th yeah. pair. So you, you have six areas you're looking at. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the approval pathway, uh, mm -hmm. picking up on mm -hmm. Mary, that you see? Now I'll turn it over to the audience. Man, I don't know. Okay. Uh, That's fair. You know, is, is the honest answer. And, and, and I'm relatively new to this game. Uh, what I'm figuring out is so is everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were just at the same conference down in, in Washington, D.C. This was a next generation uh, diagnostic conference. And, and Mary was right. You know, the first day, we were like, everybody's, you know, these are all the big the, the guys in the industry. Uh, Mayo Clinic was there. Uh, you know, and everybody said, well, okay, if this is what the regulatory environment is, I guess we're going to slog through it. And then the next day, it was like a, uh, a French government employee protest. Everybody's banging the table saying, we've got to, you know, we're, this is, we're against the government. We've got we to gotta figure out a new, new methodology. So we don't know. Um, my choice is to go with Big Pharma. Uh, they're the only ones right now that have the money and the expertise. They're the only ones that can put together a validated clinical trial set. And the issue of validation is absolutely critical. How do you validate uh, one of these genetic tests and correlate it to outcome? And how do you do it in such a way that you can tell a physician, you need to test for this gene before you prescribe that drug. And there's no way that, you know, we raised 20 million bucks, which is great for a, a new company in the middle of a recession, uh, but we'll need 10 times that in order to go after our own approval. So, we're going the partnership route with the pharma companies and with the diagnostic companies. Please. You mentioned uh, genomic health. Uh, isn't that the, the model for approval? Uh, so um, I mean, they did get it over the finish line and kind of set the pattern at least for, for a combination diagnostic test. Is that Oncotype DX? Yeah, that's Oncotype DX. Um, genomic health, I originally started talking about uh, home groups and genomic health. The question is, is genomic health the way to get a, a test done? Um, I the think they follow, right? You know, the LDT path is very tempting. And what happened after genomic health is everybody said, wow, you know, we can buy a CLIA lab, a lab with this certification that allows us to do these homebrew tests. And then we don't need regulatory approval. We can step up and say, we've got a test. We can market it ourselves. <laughs> And the regulation says as long as you do it in-house and it's your own developed methods. Um, I think genomic health, my impression, uh, and I could be wrong, but my impression is that was, uh, that was a first mover advantage for them. And they spent a heck of a lot of money, tens of millions of dollars, going direct to patient to convince them to send their samples in to the lab. Uh, and we looked at buying the CLIA lab and doing that. And we started out in brain cancer. Uh, at a Harvard, it was a horrible disease. You, know, you measure people's survival time in months, and you know you get the kids in with the brain cancer. It's just, it's horrible. Uh, but we found we can take a blood sample for the first time. We can measure the genetic profile of brain cancer. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, you know, we can we can monitor recurrence now. We don't have to drill a hole in somebody's head. We can look for new targets to treat. This is the perfect time for us to buy one of these labs and put up a plaque on the wall and say, hey, we can test for this. Uh, but I think that what's happened now is it's become a commodity. And there are a lot of people who have hung up shingles with their CLIA labs and their tests. And there's been a huge dilution, especially among one of the first things you have to do when you launch a test uh, is to get KOLs involved, so thought leaders to come in, big doctors, <coughs> Dr. Famous is to say, yep, that works. And uh, I, 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 I doubt the validity of doing that from scratch to get the, the doctors to buy in. I think you have to partner. Let's take some other questions. Please. Um, so uh, most of the uh, mutation analysis done uh, right now is using the, the tissue samples, for example, the yes. lung tissue for lung cancer. Yes. So you're using the blood samples. So can you do? Um, analyze the correlations between using blood sample and the, the test 
You're a scientist. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the qu I'm sorry, did you finish? Yes. The question was um, in lung cancer, which is the, one of the hottest areas right now, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, people diagnose lung cancer and they track it by primarily doing a needle aspiration through the chest. So you may get a CT scan, if you're coughing up a little bit of blood, you go to your doctor and you say, I'm having, I'm having problems, I, you know, I'm not feeling exactly right. They do a CT scan and there's a nodule in your lung. Were you a smoker? Well, yeah, I smoked for 20 years, but I quit. Uh, I said, okay, we need to do a biopsy. So what they do is they take a needle and they stick it through your chest cavity and they pull out a piece of tissue. And then they go and they look for some of the genetics in there. And lung cancer is a leading model in personalized medicine because it's distinctly clear uh, that you can type lung cancer. There are different types of lung cancer with different outcomes, with different uh, treatment modalities based on what the genetic mutation is that created that. So if you can get a piece of the tissue and test for the genetic mutation, it gives you a lot of information to be able to deal with it. The problem is, and the leading example in this is AstraZeneca with ERISA, which was a, uh, again, a targeted molecular therapy that treated a specific gene called EGFR in lung cancer. Uh, and they went out to do this big clinical trial, and the results were so-so. They weren't great. Uh, and it turns out when they redid the trial, uh, the reason the results weren't great was because some people responded very poorly to the drug and even had adverse effect. Some people responded very well, but when you averaged them out, there was no response in the general population. So they went back and they said, ah, let's take that sliver of people that actually responded to the drug. Uh, and that became the foundation. The problem is they only get a good tissue biopsy in about one out of three, maybe 40% of the people that get a needle aspiration through the chest. And there's a large false negative rate. So we've gone in and we're taking blood samples out of lung cancer patients right now and looking for that activated mutation because we don't have to worry about the ambiguities associated with the tissue biopsy. James, I'm, I'm going to have to, let's take one more question and uh, we have one more, <coughs> we have another panel member. I apologize for that, please. Yeah, what's the quality of the exosomes from the brain? I'm interested particularly in psychiatric disorders. For psychiatric disorders, I'd love to look. Um, some evidence in the literature of genetic dysregulation, obviously, in psychiatric disorder. Uh, the quality of the exosomes from uh, the neurodegenerative set is fascinating. Uh, and we originally didn't think they'd get across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, not only do they, but they do in quantity, uh, especially with the more aggressive cancers like glioblastoma. Um, you can just see these cancer cells, they're shedding these exosomes into the blood. And the key, what took us two years and about six million bucks to do, was figure out, we could see them there, but figure out how to get a pure enough preparation, which got rid of all the degradation that's in blood the enzymes, the, the junk that's in there, to get right to that pure uh, population of exosomes. And we've succeeded. And uh, the sensitivity and specificity is there. I mean, basically what, what the exosome allows you to do is take this massive haystack of stuff that's in blood and boil it down to a specific fraction, a small particle. Uh, and that small particle contains uh, most of the genetic abnormalities. You got it from normal cells as well as uh, cancer cells? Yeah, we do, but what happens is uh, the exosome uh, is shed uh, by normal cells, but when you have rapid cell division in a disease state, either an inflammatory disease state, uh, solid tumor, immune response, you have this rapid turnover of cells, they shed a lot more exosomes. In fact, uh, with some of the more aggressive cancers, we use one of the methods we use is a filtration-based method to filter out these exosomes. We actually clog the filters uh, in some of the stage four cancers. And I keep asking the guys in the lab uh, whether they take a blood, tra blood transfusion from an early stage cancer patient, and they're now telling me no way. Let me introduce uh, Joel Bravis, who will talk, uh, I think, a bit more, um, uh, I don't want to say pragmatic, it, it talks differently. Uh, but at, at the commercial level of where all of this is actually going. Joe. Yeah, what Arnold, I think, is saying is 
I'm not the person from the high science and regulatory background. The only thing I do is help my clients make money on the commercial side of the business. Amen. Okay. Uh, if we take a look at sales and promotion in the pharmaceutical industry, the most expensive promotional asset is the sales rep. Number one reason why doctors see sales reps is for information. Since it's analogous to information transmission, as we talk about sales reps and what's going on in the, in, in the industry, uh, kind of think of what's happened to newspapers and what their future is. When I was younger, there were seven newspapers in New York. There were three today. They're going out of business all over the country. That being said, let's take a, a step back to where we were just a couple of years ago. The macro view of the industry, there were approximately 100,000 sales reps trying to make seven calls a day on only 350,000 doctors. So what that meant is, from the pharmaceutical manufacturer's expectation, they were expecting every doctor to be available to see two reps a day. And we know that that model would not work. The question is, how did we get there? If we go back 20 years earlier, the late 1980s, beginning 1990, most pharmaceutical companies were starting to cut sales forces. There was one exception, and that was Pfizer. Pfizer had a unique problem or issue. They were blessed with many detailed responsive drugs, three in the cardiovascular blockbuster area alone. They increased their sales force. Rather than other companies using promotion response modeling to see that it would not be effective for them to increase the same way Pfizer did, they managed to increase anyway. They used resource allocation models. For those of you that don't know what that is, they're based on the military resource allocation, which could tell you how to place the resources in Afghanistan to help support our troops, rather than telling you how many troops are needed there. So we got this big blow up of reps we're starting to cut back now. But what also happened in the ensuing, in the 20 year gap, when Pfizer was putting that in, there was retail pharmacies, sole proprietorships. They've gone by the wayside to the CVS's, the Walgreens, the chain pharmacies, uh, and now even Walmart uh, has pharmacies. We had hospitals. Believe it or not, in this country, the number of hospitals is decreasing and they are becoming more specialized. So there's fewer hospitals. The other thing is, and most importantly, individual physicians have pretty much gone the way of the re individual retail pharmacy and a lot of people have not noticed that yet. Physicians are now part of HMOs, groups, managed care organizations. There are very few doctors practicing by themselves. And when we start to take a look, everybody knows that, oh, the HMOs are the managed care. And I'm looking at Bill, who, who spotted Bill Gerth, who, who was telling me about this trend 25 years ago. Everybody knows that the managed care has the formulary and describing which drug to use. But within physicians that are not part of those groups, that are not employees, in the group practices, as we do the analysis today, we see that there is a grouping, a congruity of prescriptions coming from certain groups. Other ones, they're very widespread. So within the group, there is typically one or two doctors that are kind of making the decision on which blood pressure medicine should we use, for example, or which antidepressant? So all of that is contracting. With that being said, 
there is far less need for the rep today. The other promotional influence is 20 years ago, nobody was concerned about consumers. Today we know that there's a 75% chance that if you go in as a patient and ask your doctor for a prescription, you're going to, for a particular drug that you've seen advertised, you're going to walk out of that office with that drug. So where is all, that's kind of where we are now, how we got there. Where is this going? Social media, obviously, managed care, death of the sole practitioner. Pharmaceutical sales forces have already shrunk by about 30%. I will tell you by the models I've run and the back of the envelope estimate, there is still an extra $12 billion being spent on pharmaceutical reps in this country. There is a lot more shrinkage to come, but much like, you know, I use the example of the, the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, we think back, the QWERTY keyboard, for those of you that don't know, that's a standard typewriter keyboard, was put in to slow down typists in the days when keys had to strike the ribbon. It makes no sense since the 70s to have that keyboard when the IBM Selectra came out. It made less sense as we moved into uh, computer keyboards. It makes zero sense to have it on the Blackberry that I'm working with my thumbs, but it still exists. Pharmaceutical reps will live on. What I see happening in the future is we are going to decouple rep performance, and it's already starting at uh, GlaxoSmithKline, has decoupled rep compensation from the amount of scripts in the area. We've seen AstraZeneca uh, promote a product without sales force towards the end of its prescription life cycle. There's going to be more of those things happening, less dependence on reps. The reps will decrease. The silo between sales and marketing will go away. And what you are going to see are more reps scattered by the channel of communication. And we've seen this, we've seen the start of this within managed care sales forces, where you know you need a different sort of rep and communication and value proposition depending upon the organization type that you're dealing with. If it's going to be a group practice that you're talking to, that's different than calling on an individual physician. And as, we say, as I've been saying, there's not much sense calling on the individual physician. More in social media, down that channel, and we see that happening. 65% of docs already use social media to find out information. Remember, that's the reason, that's the reason they used to see reps. They now get it at their convenience, at their leisure, without a dialogue. Uh, the other piece is going to be more on the patient side, patients coming in and asking for things. So as much as we say DTC advertising has kind of leveled off, there will be more communication to the patient, especially as we get to some of these things that James is talking about, individualized medicine. And that's where this is going to go. So fewer reps, more communication channels, reps are going to be set up within reporting into marketing based upon the communication channel. Implication also, in terms of commercialization of a product, it will become, on this side, once you clear the regulatory hurdle, it will become less expensive to actually launch the product because there were fewer contact points and without a big sales force. Excellent. That's it. Questions? Questions. What, what yeah. time horizon are you talking about and what's it going to be the impact on revenues <coughs> by phasing out of the, I mean, can you predict what will happen to revenues? So again, what time horizon are you thinking this will happen and then what will be the impact of switching the delivery model on revenues? Okay, as I try to make those sorts of predictions, uh, I, I find that the person that lives in the crystal ball soon learns to eat ground glass. That, that being said, 
it's already happening. I gave you the example of GSK. They have already decoupled. I can't think that they are not going to have more massive decreases in sales forces. Uh, AstraZeneca has already promoted a product without Salesforce involvement. One of my clients right now is going through a product launch, so it's happening today. Uh, and they're going through a product launch where there are actually white spaces on the map. And what I mean by that, there are uncovered doctors, uncovered people, because we know they are being influenced by somebody else or the amount of promotional resource to get to that doctor is not worth the return. It's happening, it will be, it will happen slower at the larger pharmaceutical manufacturers because the person that heads the sales force has been responsible for thousands of people. If you're responsible for 10,000 people, uh, and I know Mary went from being responsible for thousands of people, and then she was telling me how she went up this pyramid, and the next organization she was responsible for 300. That's an organizational shift, but a lot of the executives' worth, value, position, political capital in the company is based on the fact of how many people they have. So that, the internal politics will slow it down, Question. Uh, I mean, you, you talk about reduced costs post approval, but it seems like there are increased costs to get through approval. So, given that in the U.S. market, do you think more companies are going to follow follow the core valve path and go to Europe first, and then come back into the U.S. for approval? And I guess that's for everybody. Uh, we are seeing that. Okay. We're definitely seeing that. There's some companies are doing a rest of the world strategy first before going to the U.S., or at least going to the European Union first, um, which a lot of people feel right now is more scientific and more predictable. But we're the biggest market, so eventually everybody gets here. We just opened an office in Munich for that reason. Question in the back. Uh, so those were very insightful comments on, on the sales force. Um, but, but I'm wondering if... if, if, if is it, are we just going to see a shift, and if not, maybe an explosion in, in the transfer of information, where the model before was going to be uh, physician interact and uh, physician interaction with the sales rep, uh, but now you're thinking about digital media and social media and everything else, uh, all this content being produced and pushed at the physician. Um, so it, it seems to me like it's going to be cheaper and faster to get information to the physician, but the return on share of mind rather than share of voice isn't necessarily going to be there. What, 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 what's going to be the impact of an increase in overall voice, but not necessarily, and, and, and what's that going to be, what, what's the impact on, going to be on share of mind? Well, that, that's an outstanding question because that's where it is exactly going <coughs> as it becomes cheaper uh, to transmit via the social media, digital world, there's going to be more information that is out there. So what's going to be happening is the placement of that social media and the way it is done, the words that are used, the messages that are being conveyed. Uh, and, and forgive me, more on Mary's side, uh, Abbott got in trouble uh, a couple of years back because one of their websites, uh, part of one of their websites was taken uh, by a person who recreated it, said what a wonderful drug this was, and as a matter of fact, it was Humira, uh, self-injected and, and made a video of himself injecting. Well, it went viral and got in trouble with the regulatory. So we have regulatory issues on the controls. We have to figure out where that is going. But I think what we're going to be coming down to is really a classic marketing dilemma uh, or opportunity, which is going to be the clarity of the message, the applicability of the message, rather than the amount of times you say it. Question. I wonder if you could speak to the potential uh, impact of health, health economics outcomes research on, on uh, 
that, the, the market. Oh, that's that's where it's going, uh, and certainly it's outcomes research in the healthcare bill that is passed uh, for those people that those groups that I may be off on the numbers. I want to say it's five thousand patients that. Uh, are being paid for by the federal government. There is already a bonus that's in place uh, to treat them uh, it, if you improve the outcomes. So what does that mean? That means that the physicians, the group, the organization that's working together will work to find the most effective outcome that they believe for, for patients and use those meds. So that's, a, that's where it's really going is to a dollars and cents point of view. Can I add, in Washington there's a lot of effort being put on um, interactive uh, medical records and what people would like to see, some of the farther thinking things is when the doc has the patient's medical record and he or she is thinking about what drug to prescribe, starts right again, Plavix let's say, and the medical record will pop up. Are you sure you want to do that? This patient is, you know, has a genetic whatever that Plavix might not be good, or there's a drug drug interaction you have to be watching out for, or having a situation where the, the practice group that the doctor is in, whether it's an HMO or whatever, will have pop up the screen of all the things that physicians should do before prescribing a drug at all. So there's going to be a real fight for the hearts and minds of the physicians at that prescribing point. Yep, and absolutely, and one of the clients that I work with now has an iPad-like device that's in place in 12,500 physician offices, and it is used for patient check-in. So it is all electronic. Instead, it replaces already the clipboard and paperwork that we always fill out when we go to the doctor. There's an electronic record and it reminds the doctor of all the drugs the patient is on. Oh, and by the way, there's a credit card swipe on the side <laughs> to, to handle the copay. <laughs> so any, it's happening. Any other questions? Question for Mr. McCullough. Um, I believe you said that you launched in 2008 did your Series A in May, and I was curious what your experience in this fundraising was compared to, I believe, you said you were CEO of a previous company, um, just the environmental difference. This is tough. Uh, we did, uh, we started looking for money, it took us all in uh, just over a year. Yeah. Due diligence, the actual due diligence period once uh, it officially commenced was uh, nine months, and I had a I had a ten year relationship with uh, Four Beyond Capital Partners, which is the former ABN Amro uh, Life Sciences unit that spun out. Uh, it's just I you know these guys see hundreds and hundreds of deals, and uh, it's it's a buyer's market in every way. The term sheets reflect that. So. It's tough. <laughs> well, as an example of the toughness, 25% of all the biotech companies disappeared last year. Either they disappeared because they went bankrupt or they were bought or absorbed. So it's a tough market. Time for one more question. The question is what is the IP strategy? Um, and it's uh, the short answer is we have, we were fortunately first in the space, so we filed a series of composition of matter patents uh, around the use of nucleic acids in exosomes diagnostically. Uh, and then we have a series of, of narrower claims uh, in the composition of, of matter area. Now, most of the patents that we're filing uh, are method of use and, bless you, method of manufacture patents. Um, the, the interesting thing is uh, what's working its way through the courts right now, uh, and you know it's going to take years to resolve. But uh, and this is a fascinating question because uh, I think it, there there is some question about whether a gene is patentable and where that's ultimately going to go. 
and that's going to have a significant impact. But we've already started to see a shift in academic institutions that own the bulk of intellectual property around key genes. Uh, and uh, they're moving towards a much more open, non-exclusive licensing model. So it's get it out there, uh, let as many people use it as possible. We'll make it. We'll make the licensing revenue on the on the volumes rather than doing an exclusive license. And we're and what's fascinating is we're finding people that have exclusively licensed specific genes uh, are not seeing as much thought leader uptake in those genes because nobody's got a stake. And then, so you got to give everybody a stake in these biological elements, and then they become an accepted standard. Um, I'm going to um, call a halt for this phase of the uh, question and answer. I want to thank uh, the three panel members for an excellent presentation. So. If you